Funded Today Nation, welcome back to the Funded Today podcast. Last time we talked about how to convince the media, journalists, bloggers, and YouTube influencers to get excited and actually promote your new business. Today, we're going to walk you through the single most effective way to consistently raise money and even extrapolate how much money you're going to raise. This approach has raised more money than all of our other methods combined, and that's why we saved this one for the very last of this series on marketing. Let's get started. The Funded Today podcast is hosted by world-renowned entrepreneurs and business experts, Thomas Alvord and Zach Smith. To get help with your next big business idea or to take your business to the next level, go to fundedtoday.com. Welcome back to the Funded Today podcast. I am Zach Smith. And my name's Thomas Alvord. And in our last episode, we had the director of Earn Media Funded Today, Mrs. Samantha Adams on. She talked about how to get the press excited about writing and promoting your campaign. Give that one a listen if you've ever wanted to learn about how to get in the news. Today, got a special one for you. We have my co-host, Thomas Alvord. He's going to be playing the role of the expert special guest. He was originally our director well, and not of paid ju- media. And not just the role. I, w- I will be the expert guest, not just pretending. <laughs> Very true. He was originally our director of paid media and his strategies and approach to generating pledges using the power of paid media on Facebook and other channels is what made Funded Today originally world famous. If you've ever wondered how to spend money to make money, this podcast masterclass is for you. Thomas, this should be a really interesting episode. Rather than have you co-hosting with me, I'm going to put you on the hot seat. You ready for this? I think so. All right. Well, let's just dive right into it. Sounds good. Story time. How did you get started doing paid media? Tell us how it all happened. So I got started actually about 10, let's see, 10 years ago or so, and I was in law school, and I was planning on being an attorney. I actually didn't know what I wanted to be. I did a a JD MPA, so that's a a law degree with a master's in public administration. Uh, An MPA is kind of like an MBA, but for nonprofit government management. So you're saying you have more education than you know what to do with? Uh, Yeah, pretty much. Exactly. (laughs) And so I was never really committed to law, but I was never really committed to like the government or the nonprofit because I was in both programs and was kind kind of trying to figure my way. And at the time, I had some family who had an online business, and they were selling a product online. And it amazed me how they were basically making money in their sleep with Google AdWords. And so I thought, man, I want to figure this stuff out. So that's when I first started learning about paid media, bought a book by a guy named Perry Marshall, The Ultimate Guide to Google AdWords, I believe is the book, and went through that. And he was kind of my mentor who helped me start learning about paid media. And Thomas, let's maybe even take it back a little bit further. What does paid media mean to those who may be listening to this? We've talked about earned media. We've talked about cross collaborations. We've talked about cashback, email lead generation. Let's go ahead and define paid media as it relates to what you do and what you did. Yeah. So paid media is what it sounds like. It's getting exposure on media, but you're paying for it right? So it's predictable. If I go to Facebook and I pay $10 to do $10 in Facebook ads, that's paid media. And technically, I I suppose if you look at TV buying, right? If you were to buy a commercial on TV, that would also be paid media. My experience is with the primarily on the digital side of things. I I have done TV commercials and, and have experience with some political campaigns in that arena. But basically, the paid media I got involved with initially was Google AdWords and Facebook and Perry Marshall. He actually had a course. It was a thousand dollars. And at the time I was dirt poor, completely broke, didn't have the money, but I thought, man, if I get this, this looks like it could be really powerful, really useful. And he, he, Perry Marshall actually had a book on the old, I believe it was the ultimate guide to Facebook ads, right. And learning different strategies, how you could get likes on your Facebook page for a penny and, working on some campaigns. And so that's where I dove in and and learned Facebook. And that was kind of the beginning of my paid media journey. Okay, very cool. So Google AdWords, Perry Marshall, way back in the day in terms of internet times, how did that translate to crowdfunding paid media? Where Where did the synergy happen there? What was the connection? What bridged those two avenues together 
such that you were able to create such a successful enterprise as it relates to paid media in rewards-based crowdfunding, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, that sort of thing? After I bought the courses and started going through the content, it was probably six to 12 months until I, I got some traction. And I, I had a few different uh, of my own business ventures, and there just wasn't quite a, a product to market fit. And I, for example, I had created an online immigration self-help where basically you have step-by-step, step, here's how to file a, a government immigration form. But if you needed help, you'd have access to an attorney. And I turned Google AdWords on and I was getting five to 10 leads a day, right? For a dollar or $2 per day, or excuse me, a dollar to $2 per, per lead. And that probably would have worked out tremendously, except there's a lot of fraud and immigration and people wanted to meet in person. Well, being in Utah, if somebody's calling from Chicago or New York or LA, where I had people calling from, we weren't able to, right? And so we never got those clients. I say we, it was, it was me. And so that stopped, but I got involved in the political arena and was working with some governor races, Senate races. And that was actually my plan. I was planning on just doing political email lead generation and it was, it was going well. I was making 10 to $20,000 a month. And I thought, Hey, I got things figured out. This is working. And that's when you reached out to me and asked me about some paid media. And, now, and, now, and, now, this and, is an embarrassing story, but why don't we go ahead and recap what question I asked you and how that relates to what you were doing with paid media. And before you answer that, so you spent six months, 12 months of basically studying everything there was about paid media before you got traction, meaning you were testing things every day and things weren't working. And eventually you kind of found the formula. Is that fair to say? Uh, not every day, okay. but I would have a new campaign here, a new campaign there, and I would set it up uh, for my family who has this other online business. I actually went and was doing some work for them probably for two months, maybe. And at that time I was optimizing their Google ads. I was reading some content on copywriting. So this whole time I'm learning, right? Because mm -hmm. it's, it's not coming you know, it, it's not something you just know. And and that's what I want to do. I kind of just want to map out this roadmap to somebody who's maybe like, I'm going to do paid media. What does that journey look like for somebody, you know? So. so I was doing Google AdWords with my family and it was a little campaign here, a little campaign there, mm -hmm. learning along the way. So it wasn't like every single day I was in the, the thick of it, right? But yeah, it, it took a while, right? Because it's not like I went and I started working at some agency and they were teaching me from the ground up. I was learning this 100% myself and going and testing. I Any budget I was testing, for the most part, was my own campaign. And I think that's takeaway number two. Takeaway number one being it, this isn't some kind of overnight success story, even though it kind of feels that way with what Funded Today has become. But takeaway number two that, that I think is the most important you didn't follow a roadmap. You didn't go to an agency and an agency didn't say, hey, do this, do this, do this. You invented the formula. Nobody was doing what was being, what, what you created. Like literally in the entire world, nobody was doing this strategy. Yeah. And, and what's interesting is I got a political client and they wanted, to gen they wanted me to generate leads. And I think it was $2.50 a lead. And in the political arena, the typical way that you generate leads is through petitions, right? You you have an ad, hey, ha sign this petition. And when people sign it, they opt into the email list. And a and, petition being like support gun control rights. If yeah, you believe so, in banning guns. Exactly, in, right. Okay. And I had set up a few campaigns and my cost per lead was $5, $6. And it just was not going to work. And I remember I got up early one day I think I got up at five in the morning or so. Maybe it was six I, six. I can't remember. I got up, I went to the office and I had an idea for one more campaign. And during all this time, I've, I, I learned a little bit of coding. And so I put together a web page. I, I sent some traffic. I was trying a new approach. I turned on the ads. I went home. I had breakfast with my wife. And then an hour or two later, I went back. 
I turned things on and I thought, holy smokes, are you kidding me? I was blown away. I kid you not, I was getting leads for 10, 15 cents. And not only that, on some of my ads, my click-through rates were 60, 70%. And that ended up being like a $100,000 contract. So meaning for every 100 people that saw it, 600 or 60 to 70 people would actually click through on the ad. That's right. And then the opt-in rate was, I think, 20% or oh, wow. so. Yeah, that's so, amazing. And this was what before, just days earlier, you were getting these same leads for five bucks. Exactly. Wow. And so it, it, it's interesting too, right? It's this interesting dynamic, especially as we talk with these startups and talk with others, or even as we have our due diligence fee and we say, hey, here's our here's our setup fee for our expertise. And people think, why am I paying you $4,500 or $5,000 for your marketing due diligence and you're not spending all of that budget on the marketing, right? If I wanted to run the marketing, I'll just go run the marketing and I can spend all $5,000. But the thing is, that is why people pay somebody like us. That's why somebody pays an agency is because it, their expertise, they know who to target. They know how to create the ads. They know what metrics to look for, which we can look at and, and we'll discuss a little bit down the road here. Yeah, but makes it, a lot of sense. you know, it, it's like, if you need somebody on your basketball team to help you score, you could be like, well, yeah, I could, I know how to shoot a basketball. I'll, I, I, I can be the person. Well, obviously Michael Jordan, he knows how to shoot a basketball or LeBron James or whoever else is, is really good, right? You're paying them for their expertise. Anyone can do anything. Anyone can go turn on Facebook ads, but it's knowing what to look for, what metrics are good, what metrics are bad. And, and that's where through this whole process of running marketing, you learn that. And when you go to a new industry, it can be difficult because you don't know what metrics to look for. You don't know who to target. You don't have those audiences. And so it is, it really is a learning process. So funded today, the Michael Jordan of crowdfunding? Um, sure. <laughs> yeah, for crowdfunding, yeah, I'll take that. <laughs> I like that. All right, so now another story. And that leads us right in, looking at the right metrics, building what was built at Funded Today. What happened? I reached out to you. I said, hey, Thomas, is this a good idea? Tell me, tell me what that was all about. Yeah, so you and I had been friends, I guess you could call that, uh, digitally over Skype for a year or so. And you were consulting on the Roosport campaign and you reached out to me and there was, I can't remember, now I don't remember the name of, of the company or service, but it was a company who offered Facebook ads. And I don't, I mean, maybe you were reaching out to see if I wanted to work on the campaign. I think you were reaching out just to get my opinion and you basically said, hey, here's this service. Does it look like a good idea or not? And, mm -hmm. and you were testing so many different things. Mm -hmm. and, and I remember you had a, a ton of different little tricks and techniques all throughout the campaign you were doing. And, and this company basically said, pay us 500, we'll run targeted ads. 750, we'll run more targeted ads. And 1,000, we'll run the most targeted ads. And that was the most you could pay. You couldn't say, well pay me 10,000. It, it was like, these are your choices. Once you ran out of the 500 one, they were done. Right. And so you knew at the time that I did a lot of Facebook marketing. And so you reached out to me and you said, does this look, does this look like a good service? Does this look like a good idea? And I looked at it and I said, absolutely not. It looks like an absolutely horrible idea. This is completely stupid. And here's the reason why. And, and before you get to the why, literally this was the only way anybody was doing Facebook advertising as it related to crowdfunding at that time. That's as, right. Yeah. As crazy as it sounds in hindsight, that's, that was a strategy. Right. And yeah. The idea was, and even other agencies, which I won't name here, but, but we know and, and mm -hmm. have some friends in other agencies, literally they would say, Hey, you need to market your campaign. You need a $20,000 budget, go spend $2,000 on Facebook. Right. And so Facebook was kind of Hey, yeah, you want to promote some stuff on Facebook and go promote it. Now, the strategy was mainly earned media back then and press releases and different things. It was a much different approach to the way you do marketing, right? Crowdfunding now. And, and so, and I think this was part of my background and my learning from Perry Marshall and from others 
in is that digital marketing is not branding for a startup, right? It's direct response marketing. And there's books like Scientific Advertising by Claude or Claude Hopkins, uh, who wrote the book Scientific Advertising, that talks about the the methodology and the approach to having direct response marketing. And this book was written, oh, I, I don't know how long ago, 50 years, 70 years ago. And it was more about direct response marketing for pieces in the mill and, and how they do that. But those same principles applied. And so then applying that to crowdfunding, it was, well, you don't want to spend $500 I mean, technically, you need to spend more to even test stuff out, right? But but the concept is, if it's not working, why would you spend five hundred dollars? And if it works really well, why would you not spend more than a thousand? So the whole model was flawed. And additionally, the model was flawed for that other service because they said, "Look, you pay us the most to start with the most focused or narrow audience." And whenever you do paid media marketing or any direct response marketing, you always want to hone in on that demographic, on that target audience who is most likely to convert. And then if that converts well, you expand outward and you increase your budget. But if that most targeted audience doesn't convert, yeah, you can test some other audiences, but most likely you're not going to have a winner. Fell fast, quickest way. So I said, that sounds amazing. Let's have you give it a shot. And then you began your very first test for the Rue Sport as it related to paid meat. And how did that go? Yeah, so we turned things on and and it's so funny, right? It it seems so actually it seems so archaic thinking about it now <laughs> that there actually was no way to test the marketing results because you couldn't place a Facebook pixel which allows you to track conversions. And so we literally, I literally just turned on ads and we looked at the campaign overall and said, oh, the, the, the Delta, right? How much it was raising before was 2000 a day. Now it raised 5,000 a day. And we did that for a few days. It's like, Hey, it's raising another $3,000 a day, or I forget the exact number. Is that from what I'm doing? And, and even you were worried and, and the, the company you were working with, you're like, oh, is this, is this Right. There was no Google Analytics. There was no tracking. There was nothing other than the Delta to go by. And so we just, we proposed another idea. What did we say? Yeah, so basically we said, let's turn off the ads and then see what happens. And so we turn the ads off and it's like, oh, things died down. It looks like this is actually contributing. So then we turn things back on and I think we raise another fifty or $60,000. And what's interesting too is I think I made like $3,000, right? Not a ton of money. It was decent. And I was like, oh, that was nice for the amount of work and what I did. And was kind of like, sounds good. Adios. We'll see you. Thanks. Right. And I had no intention whatsoever to do anything in crowdfunding. And it was simply the Free Waves campaign, who was a friend of the Roo Sport campaign that we just finished, that saw what we did, needed to raise another $100,000 in, in less than 100 hours, and basically came and begged that we'd run the marketing. And and we did, and, and they hit their goal. And as they say, the rest is history. So that's basically how I got started in crowdfunding marketing. Very cool. The story is always so exciting, no matter how many times it is retold. So now I want to move on to probably what our listeners want to hear the most. How do we do it? How do we do crowdfunding paid media? And then I think along the way, I want to kind of share some tips and tricks and some ideas of what's working now, what doesn't work anymore, best ideas, best practices, uh, maybe as much detail as we can provide here so that others who are looking to do a crowdfunding campaign or really any sort of marketing can apply the paid media strategies that we do here at Funded Today to help them bring their next big idea to life. Great. So I want to start broad and then try to go narrow, okay? So opposite of the effect of uh, the way we do paid media. Yeah. In, in this yeah. All right, cool. <laughs> I, I want to give a big picture and then the, the nitty gritty, the details, discuss some of those finer points. All right. At a very, very basic level, if somebody's running a crowdfunding campaign, what they can do, what they should do, if they're not working with us or somebody like us, within Kickstarter, as well as Indiegogo, 
in your dashboard, you can create a custom link. And the custom link, if somebody clicks on that and goes to your crowdfunding page and makes a pledge, it will track back to that custom refer, right? So for example, you, you have a dashboard, anyone who hasn't seen it or been logged into a the Kickstarter Indiegogo back, back end, you'll see a dashboard that shows all the pledges and where the pledges have come from, right? Some might come from Facebook, some from Google, maybe some from TechCrunch, maybe some from Huffington Post, etc. And using a custom link will allow you to track where different pledges are coming from. And you can create multiple custom links. We actually have a link shortener called fnd.to. And it's kind of like Bitly, if people are familiar with Bitly, but how the redirect works, it tracks on the dashboard. And, and so we have tons of different unique link track, uh, link subdomains that track back to all of our different divisions and their marketing efforts. But what's important is you have to track what you're doing. You don't want to spend blindly. You need to know what, what your ROI is. So the easiest way to do it, again, is to create that link tracking in the Kickstarter dashboard or Indiegogo dashboard. And from there, what what I would do is go to Facebook. Facebook is going to be the best platform always to start with. And why is that? Because I think sometimes we have maybe listeners or even clients say, you're just going to Facebook? I mean, my answer to that, and then I'll let you expand upon it, is yeah, Facebook's got, I don't know, four or five billion people. The planet's seven or eight billion people now. If you want to have the ability to target anybody in basically the entire developed world, Facebook's the best way to get there. Is that the best answer? Absolutely. And, and that's one way to look at it. But from a practical or pragmatic, I, I, I guess I'm not sure the, the precise word, mm -hmm. but we've tested all of the different channels by which you could market, right? And you're should, we all, should we cross off a few? Twitter. Yes or no? Well, well, let, well I'll, I'll share this, okay, right? Sure. So whenever we've had a campaign that converts really well on Facebook, we've tested Twitter. We've tested Pinterest. We've done things on Google AdWords. Do they give you a return? Can you generate pledges? Yes. Can you generate pledges at as good of an ROI as at Facebook? No, never. Hands down, definitively. Exactly. And so... Why are you going to go start or even mess around with those other channels, Twitter, Pinterest, mm -hmm. if they're not going to give you as good of an ROI as Facebook? You shouldn't. Now, again, this isn't to say that Pinterest might not be better than Facebook for some businesses, but for crowdfunding where you're only live, say, for 30 days, that is it, Facebook is, is your best bet. And like you said, you have the most traffic, you have the cheapest clicks, you have the most targeted targeting and so it's it's a beautiful platform to run on and i want to make one point here as well i remember the days of google adwords i remember we were able to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars at a pretty good clip and get a pretty good return just like you described as you were doing some consulting and working with some of the businesses and some of your family businesses that you worked with as well and i want to kind of give a call to action to all of our listeners just like Google AdWords was the king seven to 10 years ago, and even probably before that a bit, in, in the sense that if you had $10 million, you probably should have spent $10 million. That is what Facebook is now. Will it be the case in two years, three years? Again, I'm speaking in pretty finite terms here because the internet is just moving so quickly. I don't know. But I don't want you to miss out on Facebook. And I don't want to be saying... I mean, this is going to get replayed hundreds of thousands of times. I don't want me to be the voice of warning and the voice of reason that haunts you because you didn't take action on what Facebook is now as to what Google AdWords PPC was seven to 10 years ago. Exactly. And I think we also see, though, that Facebook is maturing like Google AdWords, where advertisers are still coming onto the platform, but as that happens, your cost to advertise on the platform increases until you hit an equilibrium where advertisers don't continue to spend more and more just because of their ROI. And, and so we, we have seen over the last few years Facebook maturing in that regard. Supply and demand. 
Exactly. Now, going back to what I was referencing and talking about, have the link shortener and then create an ad and use for the URL that when people click, the URL that people go to, use that link shortener. And you could use that link shortener for all of your ads, or you could break it down at the ad level or at the ad set level. The ad set level within Facebook, how Facebook is structured when you create an ad, there's three levels. You have a campaign, an ad set, and an ad. A campaign would be your campaign. Call it your Kickstarter or Indiegogo campaign, okay? Then within that, you break out your marketing based off of your ad set. And at the ad set level, that's where you're specifying your demographics, where your ad's going to display, and things like that. So for example, I might have one ad set where I'm targeting males in the U.S. who are between the age of 18 and 35 who like Kickstarter, and I'm advertising to them on Instagram. And and again, I want to give people the easiest way to get started, right? What we found with the marketing we do is we actually start with the news feed on desktop. That will give you the best return for your money. So you could have an ad that targets that same demographic males in the US, 18 to 35, who like Kickstarter and target people who are on the Facebook news feed on desktop. Not even right column ad. Not right column, not mobile, okay. not Instagram, Perfect. not messages, not stories, just just that. And just advertise for, because you, you usually can optimize if you want to optimize for conversions or clicks, right? If you're optimizing for conversions, Facebook will run all of their algorithms and analytics to try to generate conversions for you, or in this case, a, a purchase for the cheapest price possible. And the, that special link that you're using is going to track well, well, your pledges? Well, technically, you're not going to be able to select to optimize for conversions because you're not able to mm-hmm. put a Facebook pixel on the Kickstarter landing page. So you're actually going to need to simply optimize for clicks. And so you'd optimize for clicks. And then within the ad set, you can have different ads. Let's say you have a watch and maybe you have one ad that has a certain title and it's a picture of a female wearing the watch. And then you have that same text, but it's a male wearing that same watch. And then maybe you take both of those same images and then you change the title to something different. So really you have four different ads and each of those ads can have a unique URL that people go to. When we run ads at Funded Today, we don't break things down at the ad level in terms of link tracking and and seeing what's giving us an ROI. That's just a little too narrow, but what we do is do it at the ad set level. So for example, if I was targeting males between the age of 18 to 35 on the Facebook newsfeed on desktop, and I'd have four ads, all four of those ads, I would have maybe be, uh, let's say uh, we have our own nomenclature that that's kind of broken down, but you'd want to put something. So if a pledge happens, you know what demographic that was. And in this case, you know, you'd have probably Kickstarter male 18 to 35. You, you, you could call that your link within Kickstarter. And that way you can track what's happening. That That is so core. And perhaps that's the biggest takeaway because you see this all the time, right? And sometimes you come to me and you think, oh my goodness, this, this client of ours is saying we're doing a horrible job. And they were saying they were getting a literally like 20X on their ads, <laughs> Right? We, see it, we see it all the time. And then what do we do? We go to them and we say, show us. And a hundred percent of the time, literally I have a standing bet. If anybody ever wants to take it, I will give you money if you beat us with your advertising. It's just something that we've done to kind of break down anybody who's lying or isn't tracking or simply doesn't understand things just to prove to them that 
we know what we're doing and we do it better than anybody in the world. Well, well, that's a double-edged sword too, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Because on the one hand, we want to show, yeah, you're probably actually tracking things wrong. So if you can actually do this, go do it. And then they'll see, oh, we're mistaken. But on the flip side, if for some reason they do something that is generating amazing results that we don't know about, heck, we want to know about it. So yeah, let us see and we're happy to pay you for it. But oh, again, yeah. we've never had anyone do that. So let's talk about generating amazing results for a sec. I've heard of some different strategies recently. We're trying some different things. Tell me about, I don't know, three or four things that are the key to generating amazing conversions. Great, great uh, question. So the first point that I want to talk about is an ad. The most important element of any ad is the image. It's not the title. It's not the little blurb up above. All those, those obviously influence it. It's actually the image. Because when somebody's scrolling through Facebook, what you're trying to do is you're trying to take their attention away, or maybe they're in some lull, right? And you're, you know how, how it is where you're just kind of scrolling and mm-hmm. scrolling and scrolling, right? You're trying to get people to stop. So you need an image that invokes curiosity. Curiosity is what we always go for. And now, again, this is important too. Curiosity is not clickbait. And we we have even had conversations with people at Facebook and Facebook has said the difference between the two is clickbait is where you hang out a carrot and people click. And then when they land on a landing page, what they get is not what you hinted at. Curiosity is where you pique their interest and it's intriguing. So they want to know more and then they click through to learn more. That's not clickbait. That's just a curiosity based ad. Okay. Let me give you an example of one that maybe we'll paint a vivid picture in your mind if you're listening to this podcast. I love to tell this story and you might have heard it before. We worked with a company that decided to take over from their grandfather a watchmaking business. And like Thomas said, the picture that we used to great effect was the two grandchildren kind of panned out so you couldn't see them too well. They were I mean they were in the frame still and then the grandfather and then on one of the grandkids wrist was a watch that you couldn't even make out. And then there was maybe an arrow or something pointing to it. And the text read, 73-year-old grandfather passes on legacy of watchmaking to grandchildren. Do you see how that image and that text and the idea of the story all combine together to form the perfect ad, leveraging the perfect image? And literally this image didn't even show the watch. You couldn't even see the watch until you clicked, which is uh, probably another point that Thomas is going to talk about. The ad, no matter how many times anybody tells you, is not meant to sell. The ad is simply to drive curiosity to your sales page, to your Kickstarter page, to your video. And the job of your Kickstarter video and your page and your reward structure and the story there is to sell. The ad is to get the eyeballs, the clicks, the curiosity, right? Exactly. I, I, I don't know if I shared this with you, Zach. I, I recently did a, an email lead generation campaign for somebody who had five videos and they were trying to get people to opt in to their email list, right? Mm-hmm. And the idea was they were going to get an email. It was a holiday thing and they were going to get an email a day for five days. And I, I did a few tests and the first test I did was actually the first video live that people could watch inside of Facebook. And then if they clicked on it, Facebook has what's called an email lead generation ad. So it doesn't take you to a landing page. It just pops up a a thing within Facebook with somebody's email pre-filled and they can just click submit to opt into your email list. So that was my first approach thinking, Hey, show the first video. People will like it. And then after people like it, then they'll be able to opt in. Well, to, to get the other four videos. But then I, I did that and it, and it did okay. It, I think maybe a 8% opt-in rate, which is actually pretty low. So then I actually created the same thing, but it was a still image ad and people would click on it. And then when they would click on it, it, take, it took them to a landing page where they could watch the first video and then opt in. That actually had a slightly higher opt-in rate. But then I did one more test where people had a, it was an ad that was a still image. If people clicked on it, it took them to a landing page and it showed the video, 
and it looked like you could click on it, but you actually couldn't click and watch the video. You had to opt in to watch the video. And surprisingly, that almost had a double opt-in rate. So again, if you're trying to get people, like Zach said, you're trying to move people along. You do not want to sell people on Facebook. That's going to be very difficult to do. You want to get them onto Kickstarter. So you want an ad that invokes curiosity. Often we found that a founder's image where it's the founder or you, the creator with your product and even not being able to see the product a hundred percent clearly is good or useful because it's invoking that curiosity. People don't know exactly what it is or they see it's a watch, but what's unique about it? What's different, right? And so people click through. Now, Thomas, talk about branding really briefly here because I know this question is going to come up because it comes up all the time. But Thomas, I can't put my face out there. I'm old. I'm too young. I'm ugly. I don't look good on camera. That's embarrassing for my brand. Yeah, if anything... If you are older or a different demographic that you think might not fit, that may even work to your advantage because it's different, right? And you you want things that look different. And to that point, never try to create an ad that looks polished and glossy and beautiful because people have their sensors on. And when they see an ad, they naturally just ignore it. You want it to look organic and authentic. Even you and me were just commenting today how you have these, a, a lot of these uh, business motivational type speakers, and they put this stuff out, and you know these short blurbs, thirty seconds, two minutes, whatever. They're not polished at all, right? It's kind of raw, organic. It's genuine. It's authentic, and that's what you want to show. You don't want to have like a picture perfect type ad. Now that's different than your Kickstarter video, interestingly or ironically enough, because. On your Kickstarter, you actually need to convey professionalism, that you're going to be able to bring this new product or idea to life, to life that you can bring it to fruition. And it needs to look amazing. Yeah, and, and it needs to look amazing. Facebook and most ad networks are social networks. And so you want to connect socially. And that's often why a founder's image, I think, performs the best. Okay. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Any other tips? Conversion yeah, related? so... What you want to do is, again, see how much you spent for each ad set, and then you have that link tracker. And how then much see- did you spend? What's the idea behind statistical significance here, perhaps? Is there a certain number or amount of clicks or a click-through rate or a conversion rate you should be searching for? Yeah. Let's if throw it, some hard metrics. So we're a, a good campaign back in the day at Funda Today when we first started literally was 8 to 12%. Conversion rate? Uh, click through rate. Click through rate. Okay. Actually, when we first started, it was between like ten to twenty percent. Okay. Meaning, uh, for every hundred people that saw the ad, ten to twenty would click through. Correct. Okay. So typically, what we'll see is between a two to four percent click through rate. If we're below two percent, we're gonna keep working on finding an ad that might work. If we're above five percent, like that's phenomenal. That, that's great. We're, we're really happy about that. And, and by the way, when we're talking about click-through rates here, we're not targeting some random place. Like Thomas said earlier, these are the most targeted people in the entire world for your particular idea. So to have a 5% click-through rate is truly phenomenal. And a right. lot of people are like, that's impossible. How can you do that? Exactly. Okay. Now, if you're under 1%, yeah, you, you absolutely definitely need to go rework that. Okay. Now, the dynamic of how you pay, right? Your cost per click, your CPC is a function, a combination of both your click-through rate and your CPM, which is kind of confusing if, if you're not familiar to it. But basically, this is how it works. When you pay for an ad on Facebook, the billing terminology that Facebook uses and other ad networks is CPM, which stands for cost per mill, which basically says for every 1,000 impressions or for every 1,000 times that your ad is shown, how much do you pay? For example, you might pay $16 for every 1,000 impressions. Now, you might only have 100 impressions, right? Maybe, Maybe you only spend for 100 impressions. And in that case, your CPM would be $16, but you would only spend 
a dollar sixty cents, right? You're only spending because you didn't get a thousand impressions. You only had ten percent of those one thousand impressions. So yeah, you, that makes sense. So you look at your CPM. That's how Facebook is billing you, and that's where if you change your click through rate, let's say you have a click through rate that's two percent, and you double your click through rate to four percent. Whatever you were paying in your cost per click, you literally will have just cut that in half. So if you were previously paying forty cents per cost per click, now you'd be paying twenty cents cost per click. So then the key takeaway here is how do you drive a higher click through rate? Exactly. That's the one, the one you actually have control over both metrics, but you have well, and let me explain your cost per click. You have control over that by creating a better ad that has a better click through rate. If you if you decrease your or rather if you double your click through rate, you're going to decrease your cost per click by 50%. Now, the CPM, you don't really have control over because you're bidding against other people and it's what the market sets, right? What the in the marketplace what the equilibrium is. So, the one way you can affect CPM though, up or down, is by your budget and by your audience size. If you have an audience size of say 1 million people in your audience and you spend $1 per day, your CPM is going to be pretty low because Facebook basically has a million people that it can show your ad to, but you're only going to spend a dollar a day. So Facebook can be very picky about who it shows to. And if there's an advertiser or other advertisers who are bidding more, Facebook can say, oh, we're just going to wait here. We're just going to wait until there's an individual where there's not a lo- lot of other advertisers bidding and we're able to get a bid in for really low. On the flip side, let's say you have an audience of 50,000 people and you go and you spend $10,000 a day on that audience. I, I'm not quite sure what it would be, but you might be spending fifty to five hundred dollars per one thousand impressions, right? You would be spending a lot of money. So that's where scaling slowly is also effective because as you start slowly, you're actually going to get your your best returns. So you see a lot of people that are worried. I've only got 35 days. I've only got 15 days left on my campaign. How do you reconcile that fact, that reality with this is working well. I need you to spend 50 grand tomorrow. So one of the other factors that is going to influence your conversion, and you'll see at the ad set level, you have different demographics that you're driving traffic to or driving traffic from. They're all going to convert differently. An 18 to 35 year old male will convert differently than an 18 to 35 year old female for different products. And so depending on the audience, it will convert differently. We have thousands of audiences at Funded Today that allow us to hone in our marketing. So if you have a widget that is like X, we probably have a few past campaigns that were similar to your widget that had a similar audience. And so we're able to market or create lookalike audiences and market to those people. But with that said, generally speaking, with these lookalike audiences that we create, and and I'll share a little bit about how we create those so people can understand if they're not familiar with it. Typically, <clears throat> typically the audience size is such that within a two to three week time frame, you can reach all of those people that you're really going to be reaching. You don't need to be advertising for 60 days. Actually, advertising for 60 days makes it harder usually because the audience gets exhausted. So two to three weeks, you're, you're going to have enough time to reach all of those people without having to increase your budget so much that your costs become so high. So what do you say to people who are like, no, that's not enough time, or you got to scale faster and faster and faster. I need to get results faster, faster. What do you say to that? Because I, it comes up a lot still, right? Even though what you have just stated is an empirical fact. Yeah, if people say that, if the goal is to have a high raise, to be able to raise some VC money or to help with retail placement, then absolutely, we we can scale. and Even more aggressively yeah, than yeah, we advised. can. But you, your ROI is not going to be as good, right? Mm-hmm. But if you're really focused on ROI 
and don't have these other objectives outside or primarily those aren't your objectives after your crowdfunding campaigns that is raising funds from investors or getting to retail, then yeah, usually people want to focus on having that a, a better margin on their campaign so they can take that and go fulfill. And, and I'm not going to name drop here, but I want to make many of you listeners feel a lot happier with your raises. So one of the most successful crowdfunding companies of all time is PopSocket. Guess how much they raised crowdfunding? I believe it was 18000 bucks four or five years ago. Guess how much money they did in revenue this last year? 160 plus million dollars in revenue. So explain that to me. Now, in that same vein of thinking, and I'm not going to name drop here, but many of the campaigns you see that raise millions of dollars, some that we've worked with, many that we haven't, actually spent millions of dollars to raise millions of dollars. Now, like Thomas said, if you're doing that to make a name for yourself and be like, I raised $5 million crowdfunding. Well, how much did you spend? That's the first question I always ask because I don't know about you. I like to make money. I like to actually get a return on my money and I don't like to spend a million dollars to make a million dollars and lose money. I like to spend $200,000 and raise a million dollars and net $800,000. That's the way I think. Now, if you've got venture capitalists, angel investors, you're trying to make a name, you're trying to pitch some people, who knows? I mean, that could be a strategy. But my advice to you is don't come to Fund It Today. Don't come to us and say, hey, I want this campaign. Chances are we we know that campaign or we know the numbers behind it or maybe we even worked with it. And we can tell you the insider nitty gritty details that make that beautiful million dollar plus raise not nearly as mesmerizing as it seems on paper. Going along with that, Zach, I, I often look at it and I call it the deception of crowdfunding hmm. because it is so deceiving that you look at a campaign and how much it has raised and you have no clue the story behind that campaign. I remember a few years ago, and this is totally against Kickstarter's terms, so don't do this, but there was a campaign. They had raised like six or $700,000. I'm not going to say what the project was, uh, but basically this campaign had prototypes, but they actually didn't have prototypes. Their whole goal was to raise this money and then go find some investors to be able to create the product. So it looked like they were, you know, flying high. Things were amazing. They had these amazing prototypes. Why didn't I think of that type of thing or create that? But they hadn't even created it. And there have been campaigns literally that we have been spending a dollar to raise 90 cents. Typically, we don't in terms of what directly tracks in terms of the overall campaign. You know, it, it's more. And again, it depends on your objective, right? For some people that maybe have a retail play or are already in retail, it, it, it actually makes sense, right? Because you're you're not losing money. You're 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 still at a break even or making a profit, but your brand's getting exposure. And I want to make another point on that too. We've seen different agencies. Sometimes people creep up and our strategy on paid media is to spend as much money as possible on your campaign, on any campaign we work with, such that we just aren't losing money. Now, a lot of people that I've seen recently, they'll do this strategy. Hey, we're going to charge you $2,500 in setup, due diligence, whatever they want to call it, and we're only going to charge you 25% of our links meaning like Thomas talked about earlier with tracking. If we raise you $1,000, then you'll pay us $250 and we'll cover the ad spend too. That model is ridiculous. And they'll also say, well, we're so vested in your campaign. We love your product. We love your business. No, they don't. If they loved your product, if they loved your business, they would charge you a reasonable fee, like 30% of the total campaign raise so that they can spend the $50,000, $100,000, maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars to raise your campaign millions of dollars. If they're charging you 25% links and covering your ad spend, they're taking your 2500 bucks. Because if you don't have an exceptional idea where they can spend 250 bucks or less for every $1,000 they raise, then they're not going to raise you any money and you just lost your 2500 bucks. It is so important to recognize paid media as the holistic model it is. Meaning you might spend $100 in paid media and it might directly track 200 So a two to one direct ROAS, we call it return on ad spend. But guess what? 
Like Thomas talked about, the overall campaign went up $3,000 that day. And so there was this positive externality of untracked, yet most likely, not even most likely, guaranteed, because of the result of paid media that resulted in this huge surge. And that's because of the paid media. But guess what? If you're paying somebody on links, you are not going to get that effect because they aren't going to spend the money necessary to create that spike, that bump in your campaign. And that's a huge, huge, huge fallacy that I see creeping up all over this industry. And it really is a shame because that's it's just almost purely dishonest, really. Now, now to clarify, you're talking, Zach, about people who say, you pay me 25% of what my marketing tracks for or what my links track for. And that includes the ad spend. Yep. That's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I had, I was not even aware of that. And mm-hmm. that is for, that is the biggest scam ever. And and I had, th- this is the first time mm-hmm. I'm hearing about it because yeah. there's no way you can spend and have a profit at, at that clip, unless perhaps you are this incredibly successful campaign, mm-hmm. your conversion super high, and and even then, that's probably your break-even point at best case scenario I, at, on a very small and narrow audience. One more fallacy I want to tackle, and Thomas can add his two cents on this as well. A lot of people think, well, I need to hire every single agency. Why is this a bad thought? And I'll, and I'll add in my two cents. It's bad because you don't need to do that if you hire the right agency, or if you have the right audiences and the right marketing in place, because if you hire five, six, seven, even two or three different agencies, because you're like, well, they have different audiences or they have different, it's just not true. They don't. And most likely they have nothing and they're just targeting broadly, which is completely against everything Thomas talked about today. All it's going to do is make your costs more, make the agency be able to spend less, make their click-through rate lower, increase audience fatigue, increase frequency of all the different paid media that's running, and ultimately hurt your campaign. And we've seen this time and time again. And yet, quite frankly, I'd say it's coming up more often than it ever has over the last year or so where people are like, well, yeah, let's hire you and I'm going to hire these other four too. Is that cool? No, it's not. Why? Well, and, and what's interesting, and I had never thought of this analogy before, but that would be like wanting to put up, let's say you're in a, a city and let's say you're in L.A., and you want to get billboards up and you're like, man, I want to really grow this thing. I'm going to go hire all of the billboard agencies that do anything in LA. And then you think I'm going to get such good exposure. I'm going to make sure I tap everybody. And then all of those agencies go to the billboard companies and they all put in a bid and they're like, Oh, look at this. We got all these people. And then you're paying double for the billboard because you have the same people bidding on that same audience. That's basically what's happening That's a great when, when you have multiple agencies all targeting the same audience. So if you're targeting the same audience, you don't need them. And as Zach said, the only benefit would be, are you targeting audiences that maybe one agency doesn't have? And in terms of you know, the large crowdfunding agencies, they're all going to have pretty similar audiences. The bigger the agency, they're going to have a, a wider reach. If it's smaller, it, they're not going to have a wider reach. It's going to be just a subset of what the bigger agencies typically have. Now, the other thing you need to ask if you're hiring a paid media agency, and this one I see all the time as well, because of this idea that multiple agencies are working on the same campaign, you'll see an agency. And again, I'm not going to name drop here, but I'd be happy to answer these questions and provide any sort of proof on the back end for anybody who who's asking. You'll see a lot of agencies say, we worked on this campaign. Oh, did you? Prove it to me. That needs to be the next question you always ask. At Funded Today, every campaign we work on, we will tell you exactly how much money we directly tracked for with paid media, cross collaborations, press, earned media. As far as I have seen, nearly every other agency in the world or people or whoever is doing crowdfunding nowadays are going to piggyback on our success and say they worked on a campaign when, quite frankly, a lot of times we don't even see them raise any money or they raise significantly less and by significantly five six seven even 10 to 20 times less money and again that goes back to thomas's original point you need to track everything because if you track everything you can actually see who's raising you money and who is not raising you money and that needs to be the first question you ask of any agency well show it to me show me 10 campaigns you've worked on and how much money you've raised and how much did the other agencies raise and if they don't have that proof for you you shouldn't hire anything else thomas what do you want to do to wrap up this episode and maybe give some takeaways some feedback Paid media, summarized. 
One last metric that I think it's important for people to understand is earnings per visitor. Mm. Conversion rate is another metric, and I'll, I'll define and describe both of them. But the earnings per visitor is the most important. The conversion rate tells you for every 100 visitors, how many of those people become a customer? How many of those people make a purchase? So if you have 100 visitors and you have three people for every 100 visitors that make a purchase, then your conversion rate is 3%, right? Three divided by 100. Pretty straightforward. Now, what if I gave you, hypothetically, I have two campaigns and I say, hey, I'm going to... I'm." I'm going to give you ownership in either of these companies. Uh, just a freebie. I'm just going to throw it out to you. And I'm going to tell you two metrics. One campaign has a conversion rate of 5% and another campaign has a conversion rate of 10%. What campaign, what company do you want? If you're just looking off those numbers, you'd say, well, probably the campaign or the product that has a 10% conversion rate. Well, you may be right, you may be wrong. We actually have absolutely no clue. We don't know which one is better. Because what if the product that has a 10% conversion rate, what if they sell that product for $10? That means for every 100 visitors, there's 10 people who are purchasing because it's a 10% conversion rate. And those 10 people are making a purchase for $10. So every visitor in that case is generating on average $1 per visit. Because again, you have 10 visitors who each make a $10 purchase. That's $100 in revenue. And you had 100 visitors. And I'm going to change the numbers just because I think it's useful. Let's, let's pretend that the product costs $8, okay? So you have 10 visitors. Who make a purchase for eight dollars each? That's eighty dollars in revenue for every one hundred visitors. If you were to look at that and say, "What is the average amount raised per every visitor?" In this example, it would be eighty cents. Because if you take a hundred visitors times eighty cents, you get eighty dollars in revenue that was generated. Well, now let's go back to this other campaign or product that had a five percent conversion rate. What if that product actually cost $1,000? Well, that means there was five customers or purchases for every 100 visitors, and they each spent $1,000. Well, that would actually be $5,000 in revenue for every 100 visitors. Well, would you rather have $80 in revenue or $5,000 in revenue for every 100 visitors. Well, obviously you'd want the 5,000. The the earnings per visitor would be $50. So on the one campaign that has a 5% conversion rate on average, the earnings per visitor is $50. Now on the other campaign, you have a 10% conversion rate, but you only have an 80 cents earnings per visitor. And if the math didn't make sense, I don't blame you math, at least for me, I like to see on paper and look at it. And as you can tell, as I was doing this just on the fly, I got kind of mixed up there. The important, the important takeaway is the important this, takeaway is it's sixty-two and a half times better in terms of earnings per view in the latter example, right? And you have to factor in what the purchase amount is, right? Combined with the conversion rate, and that gives you the earnings per visitor. And now you have some basic metrics to look at: what's my cost per click for your ads? And specifically for your ads, what's your earnings per visitor? Different traffic sources will have a different conversion rate. And so if you have your friends, family, and fools backing, your conversion rate and earnings per visitor will be way higher than, say, paid media. And if you land press, it's going to be different. And cross-collaboration, it's going to be different. But basically, now you can see, for my ads, I'm spending this much per click, and my earnings per visitor is this much. I'm spending 50 cents say, for example, per click, and my earnings per visitor is $3. And now you have some metrics to look at and and to kind of gauge what's happening, what's not happening. And do you scale up by spending more or do you scale down by spending less? And for those listeners like me who ask a lot of questions, when do you know what your EPV is? 
Because just like you said, if you have your triple F going in, that's not going to be an accurate EPV until you have other sources of traffic come through. So is it a number of days? Is it a total number of visitors? When can we say, okay, my campaign's EPV earnings per view is $4.80. When do we, when can we make that assessment so that we can figure out how much money we want to spend and make that extrapolation that we talk about? If you go to Google Analytics, Analytics, the Google Analytics will show you this information. And this is why it's important to know how much where the heck was I going? Tracking. And, and that's why it's important to have your tracking enabled from day one so you have those metrics. But but out of the gate, you're going to see those metrics. And that's also why it's important to have unique links for each of your different traffic sources so you can see what's happening. Otherwise, you might go spend 5000 or 10000 on Facebook and you're like, hey, look, I raised $50,000 on my campaign in the first week. And guess what? Maybe those Facebook ads... Maybe you spent 10,000 and you actually only generated 2,000 in pledges because of that. And it was a mess and it was actually press or something else that was generating that money. But again, Google Analytics, and I believe it's, we, we have a backend that tracks all of this so we can easily see this for all of the different ad sets. And, and, and this is why, again, people might think, why, why hire Funded Today or another agency? It's because we do this day in, day out. I can't remember the client we worked with, but he, he basically looked at everything we did and then made a comment like, oh, you know what? I think I'm just going to stick to design and I see why people hire an agency. <laughs> now, yeah. that doesn't mean you can't do it. And, and you know, I'm not saying do one do one or the other. You, you need to look at what your situation is. But with Google Analytics, I believe it's earnings per view or earnings per visitor is the metric inside of Google Analytics. And it would break down every traffic source. And, and that's and you what you want to do. You got to break it down granularly. You can't look at your overall average because your overall average is going to be skewed. You need to look at each source. And then based upon each source, Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, press, cross collaborations, cashback, affiliate marketing, influencer marketing, and then determine from there what you are willing to spend based upon that key number, your EPV. All right. Well, this episode has been absolutely intense. I mean, if you pay attention to this episode, you literally have the formula for running paid media on your campaign. And this is coming from the guy who spent millions, <laughs> eight figure millions of money on paid media to the tune of over $220 million raised now. So, wow. Thanks for coming in, Thomas, and let sharing me, some let of me, your knowledge it, here. It, and, and I want to wrap it up here. I'll share just one last thing because I, I realize I failed to address it earlier. Sure. Because we did share the formula. And one of the main things, obviously, is, is we know the ins and out, but we also know the audience or have the audiences, right? Which a lot of people don't have, and that's why they'd hire us. To create a, a, a custom audience, basically how it works is you upload a list of email li of emails or other information into Facebook and Facebook matches that to people that they have in their system. And that's called a custom audience. And then once you have a custom audience and you have to have at least a hundred people or maybe 500, I, I can't remember. It, it changes here and there and different platforms have different numbers like Google. But once you have that custom audience, you can then tell Facebook, create an audience that looks like the custom audience I just uploaded. So they'll analyze the age, the demographic, the psychographic, the interest, the behaviors, everything they have. And then they will say, here's 10% of the population that looks like the people that you uploaded. So if you have a customer list and you're launching a product that's similar to your existing product lineup, then you'd want to use a, a custom audience. And, and that's what I was referring to. And that's but, another reason to hire an agency rather than go it alone, because they're going to have access to these custom audiences that it would take you years and hundreds of thousands of dollars to even millions in the case of Funded Today to build. Exactly. But everything in life is easy if you know how to do it. And what I just shared is really the core and the core principles that you would take, whether it's for crowdfunding or even e-commerce or anything else, right? What's your EPV? How are you doing the tracking? What's your cost per click? What's your click-through rate? What's your CPM? How do you change any of those factors? Are you using good images that invoke curiosity? Are you having your landing page do the conversion? And with those tools, you can build a, a successful campaign. Powerful. I love it. Man, this episode's going to definitely be one you're going to want to bookmark, come back to, re-listen to, 
get out the notepad, take some notes, and then go take some massive action. There's a saying that I also love that I think wraps this one up beautifully. I say it all the time. Until you can spend money to make money at a profit, you don't have a business. So keep that in mind. Leverage the power of paid media. Take advantage of everything Thomas. I mean, he just opened up the whole kimono for you. This is massive, massive value on today's podcast. We're going to have to get you speaking more. I like you much more as my expert guest than as my co-host. So thanks again. Oh, so I'm not on anymore. (laughs) Oh, we're going to have you every time. (laughs) Okay. It is time for one of the favorite parts of the Funded Today podcast, and that is the Funded Today products of the week. Thomas, what do you have for us this week? My product for the week is the Camper Hooded Jacket 2.0. It's basically a jacket that has outdoor functionality, but it has like a really urban style. And it's pretty much completely waterproof. It's super lightweight. I It's actually really cool. I was I was just showing uh, someone else here at Fun Today. But the jacket itself has like a sleeve within it that folds into itself. So it makes it super easy to carry around. And it is hyperallergenic. It's antimicrobial. Uh, like I mentioned, you can pack it on the go. It keeps you super dry. It has really good insulation and it's sustainably made. So, and, and it's raised, let's see here, I think uh, over 250,000 now. So check it out. It's actually a pretty cool jacket. The Camper Hooded Jacket 2.0. All right. Thanks, Thomas. And my product of the week is none other than Longtime funded today client, Decibels. But this time they have something really special for you. They have created from their Decibels line of products, Black Diamond. This is their new custom molded true wireless earphones. I go to the gym at least a couple times a week. I probably need to be going more. These are the only headphone that I wear. They're custom molded to fit your ear. For some reason, my ears are oddly shaped. Don't know what that's about, but these headphones fit my ear perfectly. I can shake my head around. I can bounce it up and down. I can be running on the treadmill, lifting weights. Absolutely amazing product. They've already raised 70,000 bucks and they haven't even been live 24 hours. Check them out. This product is amazing. And I love these guys. They're going to deliver. They're going to fulfill. They've always been good. And I think you're going to love it. The Black Diamond custom molded true wireless earphones, all day battery, digital awareness, award-winning sound, and extreme comfort. Probably the best headphones you're ever going to have. Check them out on Kickstarter live right now for another 30 days. And remember, Funded Today listeners, don't wait until tomorrow. Get funded today. Funded Today is the worldwide leader in rewards-based crowdfunding on Kickstarter and Indiegogo. Combined, they have raised over $200 million and counting for thousands of new ideas and inventions worldwide. If you've got an idea for a new product or invention, visit FundedToday.com to speak with one of their experts.